Okay. Um, we want to uh, welcome our uh, next keynote speaker, Graham Newbig. Uh, he'll be talking about unblocking resources for under-resourced languages. Uh, Graham Newbig is an associate professor at the Language Technologies Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. His research, research focuses on multilingual natural language processing, natural language in, um, interfaces to computers, and machine learning methods for NLP, with the final goal of every person in the world being able to communicate with each other and with computers in their own language. He also contributes to making NLP research more accessible through open publishing of research papers, advanced NLP course, course materials, and video lectures, and open source software, all of which are available on his website. Thanks again. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, everyone. Um, I'm happy to talk about unlocking resources for under-resourced languages. Uh, this was work mostly done by uh, PhD students, Shruti Rijwani and Shinyi Wang, um, in collaboration with Ant Antonis Anastasopoulos, Daisy Rosenblum, and Sebastian Ruder. Um, so if we look at language technologies, uh, there's been a lot of recent progress expanding NLP to many languages, uh, including multilingual benchmark data sets for NLP tasks, uh, pre-trained language models, and commercial models that support many languages. Um, and if particularly we look at uh, the models uh, here, very often they're trained on unlabeled text for us, such as Wikipedia and Common Crawl, and uh, support somewhere on the order of 100 to 200 languages. Uh, with various degrees of quality, of course, you know, uh, lower resource languages do work, uh, less well in more uh, resource languages. And this also enables uh, things like NLP applications uh, through cross-lingual transfer, uh, all the uh, ones that we know and love uh, down here. Um, and there are also multiple uh, societal benefits of NLP that includes many languages, including access to information uh, in education, um, and also uh, language technologies such as virtual assistants that can serve many more people. Uh, however, uh, despite the fact that, you know, 100 and 200 languages is far better than we were at before, of course, there's still, uh, you know, many, many languages that are uncovered here. Uh, estimates vary, but uh, many of them say there's around 7,000 living languages. And so 100 to 200 is about, you know, 1 to 2% of this. Um, and also, uh, if you look at the number of people who speak these languages that aren't included in these multilingual models, that's you know, up to 2.2 billion people, which is you know, a lot of people. So what's stopping us from expanding NLP systems to more languages and uh, serving people? And one of the big things is now we have uh, relatively good models to train NLP models on unlabeled text. Um, but in many cases, like we had the previous uh, speaker, Kristen, right, um, who uh, mentioned that, you know, you need to look at the places where you can get corpora at all for languages in order to build uh, NLP systems. And this is a big bottleneck. So if we look at the amount of unlabeled text that we could get, for example, on Wikipedia, which a lot of people use, it has this very long uh, tailed distribution um, with English first, um, Cebuano second, I don't know if people know about this, but Cebuano has a whole bunch of bot generated articles on it, so they're not actually real Cebuano, but um, yeah, and then we go all the way down to uh, most languages not having very many resources at all. Um, and in addition, annotated data sets are even more scarce, so we need existing text data or have to recruit uh, speakers to create it, and um, multilingual language models uh, performance is limited by the amount of text available. And then uh, if we stretch this out even farther and don't just show 200 languages, of course, there's a really long tail of languages that have no data at all on Wikipedia. So um, one of the questions from the talk here is how we move towards including these languages in modern NLP systems. And actually one interesting thing is textual resources do exist in many more languages, um, but often they're locked away in formats that are not machine readable. Um, that's not to mention speech, which is not the topic of the talk here. There's, you know, many more speech resources than even text resources, but I'm going to be mainly talking about text this time. So just to give some examples, uh, there are printed books, uh, handwritten notes by linguists or, uh, or other people, um, typewritten documents that were created a long time ago, uh, but aren't easily able to be processed. 
In addition, um, if we aren't just talking about uh, text like sentences, there's also other things like bilingual lexicons and there are uh, places with structured um, materials of bilingual lexicons like the Panlex database, which has lexicons for a very large number of languages. And there's also efforts like SIL's rapid word collection, which attempt to create bilingual lexicons, comprehensive bilingual lexicons for many languages. And this can be done in you know, a few weeks of work uh, compared to you know, a much larger amount of time that it takes to do a more standard uh, linguistic documentation. Uh, so what can we do with these things is the topic of this talk. And so uh, by unlocking non-traditional resources or the ones that we don't normally uh, use in NLP, we have two goals. Uh, the first one is to enable NLP for under-resourced languages uh, for whatever purpose the people who speak the languages uh, would like to use it for, um, including uh, you know, multilingual uh, language models for more languages or annotating data sets for downstream NLP tasks, um, and also supporting communities that speak the languages. So. Um, one of the big goals of our digitization project is to make the texts more uh, digitally accessible and searchable so people can go through them for either linguistic or language learning purposes. Um, also aiding uh, language researchers, educators, and libraries. So if we had more interlinear gloss texts, we could extract grammars from them, we could extract rules uh, for language education uh, from them and other things like this. So the first part of the talk, I'm going to talk about unlocking undigitized test. And this is work um, mostly by Shirdi Rishwani, a PhD student at CMU. And uh, so what we do to extract text from scanned documents is normally uh, we get a scan of text somehow from a library or um, uh, you know, either scanning it ourselves. And this is uh, in particular a scan from a book of folk tales in Greco, which is a uh, language from Southern Italy, but it's more closely uh, related to Greek than Italian. Um, we then run it through optical character recognition to get machine readable text. Um, but one issue with this is that uh, we have high accuracy on languages that have easily available resources. Um, and we also have off the shelf tools that support many scripts and languages. So uh, one thing about uh, many endangered languages is there aren't that many of them uh, there are some, but there aren't that many of them that use a very, uh, you know, an orthography that's completely different than any other uh, language. Many of them use some variant of Latin orthography. Uh, many of them use some variant of the other orthography in the, the region. So, um, and uh, there's lots of examples of the, these uh, things that support many scripts like Google Vision, Tesseract, ECOCR, et cetera. Um, however, there's little to no prior work on using these in very low resource settings for languages that have uh, very little textual material. And um, so in order to handle this, we have a couple uh, papers on this topic. Uh, the first one is creating evaluation data sets and looking at the promises and pitfalls of existing methods, and also looking at how we can change uh, neural OCR uh, methods to have good performance even in this extremely limited data setting. And uh, another uh, paper that we have uh, at Tackle is uh, semi-supervised learning to improve performance with unlabeled images, which is uh, very important because often we can annotate a certain amount of data, but we can't annotate all the data we have, otherwise we wouldn't need to do OCR in the first place. So um, our evaluation data sets that we created for low resource uh, OCR were based on uh, largely books in the languages that we want to work on. Um, we uh, have Ainu, uh, we have Grico, um, uh, Yaka and Kwakwala. And Ainu is a language isolate from Japan. It's typically written in uh, either a variant of the Japanese katakana or um, in Latin characters. We worked on uh, transcriptions in Latin characters. Uh, Greco is written in Latin characters uh, and it has mixed in Greek characters like the Greek Kai here. Um, Yaka is uh, from Nepal and it's written in kind of a uh, variant of the Nepalese uh, script. And then Kwakwala is written in a variant of the Latin script with some uh, you know, extra characters like the lowercase e that you see here. Um, so they're orthographically, typologically, geographically diverse. Um, oh, sorry, Yaka uh, is a variant of De Devanagari, sorry. My apologies. Um, 
then the uh, the languages uh, that we have here currently have no Wikipedia or common crawl text or didn't at the time we did the research. Uh, they weren't supported by multilingual LMs and they had no easily accessible bilingual uh, lexicon. We uh, transcribed these or used existing transcriptions. So each had a thousand or less uh, transcribed lines per language. And uh, so that's the resource constraints we're facing uh, when we have to build these um, models. So uh, for existing OCR methods, um, there are supervised methods using large uh, neural networks and they require, require you know, tens of thousands of transcribed images. There's also unsupervised methods uh, that use unlabeled image, images in a language model. And these require a large text corpus or lexicon in the target language. And in our case here, we don't really have uh, either. Um, or if we do have them, they're extremely limited in size. Um, and then we can also use off the shelf uh, models that support many different languages or support the script as a whole. Uh, but they're not trained on target languages themselves. Uh, so we can also uh, start out with them and try to improve on them. So uh, what we do here is we work with either of these two latter methods, and then we uh, try to further improve the performance for the languages we're interested in. So if we look at the word error rates, um, which is the word at distance between the prediction and reference uh, divided by the number of words in the reference, uh, here, lower is better. Uh, we took a Google Vision, which is an off-the-shelf model for many different scripts, and we used the appropriate script-specific models. Um, it does uh, reasonably well in some cases and extremely poorly in other cases. So, for example, on INU, which largely uses Latin script, the word error rate is actually pretty passable without any INU-specific um, uh, developments. Uh, Grico, uh, Yaka, and Quacola are very vary from very bad to uh, you know, uh, moderate. And uh, a lot of this has to do with language specific characters that aren't included in the, uh, the actual script. Um, here uh, in Quaquilla, when I say the script is not known by the model, it's basically, it's a ver variant of the Latin script, but there's so many uh, different unique characters here. And also another thing to note is our scans in Quaquilla are a bit worse than the ones in the other uh, languages as well, which makes a big difference. So if we look at an example in Greco, uh, what the Google OCR model produces, it produces something that looks a little bit like this, uh, where it's missing the special Thai character, which is distinct from the X in the transcription. So you need to know the difference to know the pronunciation. Um, and also it's missing uh, the diacritics on the Ds, which are also important. Um, I'd like to remove the Zoom bar if I can. Um, I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll plow ahead and hope it disappears. Um, we also used Ocular, um, and this is an open source. Okay, thanks a lot. We also use um, Ocular, Ocular, which is an open source unsupervised OCR software, uh, which requires an LM in the target language. And um, The uh, results are somewhat interesting. Uh, so basically uh, we used only the very small transcribed text that we had for the language and we trained this unsupervised system on it. And we can see it varies from uh, like much worse to much better than Google OCR. Um, and this more or less depends on um, whether the language uh, has you know, a good script model uh, in Google OCR. So in Quapla, there was no good script model. So Ocular is a bit better. Um, but for Ainu and Yaka, there is a reasonably good uh, model for that script. So uh, Ocular is quite a bit worse. Um, so if we look at uh, these, what we can see is there's considerable room for improvement uh, compared to high resource languages where the word error rate can be, you know, in the fives, uh, five, three, two, one. Um, uh, on the other hand, it does recognize the majority of the words correctly with the best model that we have. So, you know, more than half are recognized correctly. So in other words, uh, we can say this is a reliable starting point for further improvements. So uh, what do we do to improve the results of the existing OCR systems? Uh, basically, we take the uh, OCR output, which is our first pass. It has lots of errors, but it also uh, works some of the time. 
And uh, we do automatic OCR post-correction uh, using basically a sequence-sequence uh, model to map the uh, broken OCR uh, outputs into a corrected transcription. And um, previous work uh, has shown that this improves results for unseen uh, fonts, layouts, and domains. But uh, here we're going to be talking specifically about what we need to do for very low resource languages. As I mentioned, this is a text-based sequence-sequence task. Um, so we take our text input, get our text output. And um, pre prior work has just used standard uh, character level sequence-sequence models with attention. So you throw it into an LSTM or transformer and, uh, and generate the outputs. Uh, I'm not going to go into a whole bunch of details about the specific things we did, but basically we added uh, several standard techniques for improving the robustness of sequence sequence models to make sure that this works well in the setting where we have very little uh, training data. And so we do things like adding a diagonal attention loss to make sure the attention goes down the diagonal because, um, you know, post correction is a mostly monotonic task. We add a copy mechanism to allow it to easily copy characters. And we also add a coverage mechanism to make sure it's not dropping lots of content. Um, we also do something interesting, which I think is relatively unique to the uh, like low resource setting or the endangered language setting, which is we also uh, can leverage additional information from the source document. And the reason why we can do this is if we look at um, the texts that we have for endangered languages, very often they're also translated into a language of broader communication in the area. Because um, you know, they're, the documents that we have very often are like stories, which are used to uh, pass on the stories to uh, people from the culture, especially kids who learned like the other language that's more uh, predominant in the area. Uh, they can also be things like dictionaries or interlinear losses. And be, so because of this, we might also have another higher uh, resource language. In this higher resource language, we might have very good OCR for it. it might be English, where the OCR is, is you know, not perfect, but uh, very, very good. So uh, what we did was we also proposed a multi-source model for post-correction, which takes in um, the more broadly spoken language. So in this case, for Greco, um, we also had Italian in the same documents. And so we have two uh, encoders in the model, one high resource encoder, one low resource encoder. And uh, we do attention over both of them and uh, feed them into the decoder LSTM. And so ideally, uh, what this could learn is this could learn like systematic uh, pronunciation vari variations between another related language or something else like this. Unfortunately, a lot of the time, the language that we have is actually not related to the language that uh, is being transcribed. So like if we have English and it's uh, like, uh, indigenous American language or indigenous Australian language or something. They're not related uh, very much at all. So, uh, you know, the utility of this method depends on how uh, close together the languages are, but um, still, uh, I think it's a good tool to have. Um, so if we look at how the experiments work, we have our first pass OCR um, using just an encoder decoder, like a lot of previous work. And um, we did a cross validation to calculate our word error rate. And the reason why is just because our test set is so small that it's hard to um, uh, you know, do it by having a separate training and test set. And so if we look at uh, Google Vision, Google Vision, Google Vision, and Ocular, which were the best uh, systems that we had for each of the languages, um, the regular encoder decoder uh, sometimes helps, but sometimes breaks things uh, drastically. So um, if you just throw this into your favorite, you know, uh, machine translation toolkit, you might not expect that it would work well just because the data set is so small. Um, but with all the proposed adaptations, we get a pretty consistent uh, improvement of reducing the word error rate in about half. So uh, the most, the adaptations that were the most helpful were basically uh, the, the copy mechanism impacts the performance the most. So if you're using a, a like toolkit with a copy mechanism implemented, then you could just uh, do that as well. So another thing that we tried is improving uh, performance without doing additional annotation. And uh, as I said, this is really important because we might be able to get lots of unannotated text, only a little uh, annotated text. And uh, so we take a very small number of manually transcribed pages and do supervised training, uh, get a model. 
And then we take a large number of raw images that need to be digitized. And uh, in our data set, most documents contain, you know, 300 to 800 pages, but only 30 or less are manually transcribed. So um, what we do is we do first pass OCR on the unlabeled images, train a post-correction model, um, take the best supervised model that we have and uh, create the post-correction predictions and then retrain the model on this predicted data. So this is fairly standard uh, self-training. Uh, we ask the model to generate the outputs and, um, and retrain the model. Um, but self-training may also introduce noise. Like the reason why we need this uh, you know, training is because the model's imperfect in the first place. And so we also added an innovation uh, to bias the post-correction model towards generating the correct words. And specifically how we do this is we realize that there's many words that appear many times uh, throughout the entire corpus. And the majority of the times these words are recognized correctly, um, but there's also a lot of noise where they're recognized uh, incorrectly in, in some way. And um, so different subsets of the characters are incorrect. And the thing we note is that the noise that we get from the self-training tends to be inconsistent at the word level. And correct forms uh, end up being more frequent much of the time. So uh, another idea is, uh, can we use the word frequency information to bias the model towards the correct forms? And uh, the way we do this is we take our standard sequence sequence model uh, probability um, for, with the next character probability. And then we also add a frequency-based probability to explicitly bias the model. And the way we do this is uh, by creating a count-based language model. Um, so we take the predictions from self-training and any annotated data that we have, and we train a smooth unigram language model uh, using the counts of the word forms, and we create frequency-based uh, word level probabilities. And um, so this is like essentially a noisy weighted lexicon of the words uh, that appear in the predictions. And if you also had a lexicon for the language, you could additionally add the lexicon for the language to bias this probability further. Um, and so what I mean by smooth here is uh, rather important. So basically, um, I have an example here. Um, so if we have, uh, we always have a probability for unknown words. So the model is always allowed to generate unknown words that it's never seen uh, before. And that's to essentially encourage the model to still be able to recover from any mistakes it made in its first pass. Um, but we now have a word level language model and a character level OCR post-correction model. So how do we reconcile these two things together? And the way we do this is we create a weighted finite state automaton uh, representation of the word level language model um, where each transition in the automaton is a character level. So we have the starting here and then we have a D, O, G, um, where uh, the first uh, transition is the probability from the count-based language model. And uh, the weight of the path for dog is the same as the word level LM. We also have DOOR, uh, where the probability for the path of disks is equivalent. And then we also have, um, so if we get an output, then it will step through and uh, basically go uh, DOOR. And um, when we hit a space, basically, in the output, um, that's when the probability, uh, then the model will uh, transition back to the starting point and like restart new words. We also have an unknown word state. And basically, the unknown word state gets the probability of the unknown word. And then we have a character engram model to score unknown sequences. And um, so basically, this allows us to calculate the probability of uh, words in the vocabulary, unknown words. And um, one other nice thing about the weighted finite state automaton uh, formulation here is there are operations over finite uh, state automaton to make them very compact and also make sure that you're applying the correct weights at the correct time. So actually, the probability of any word that begins with a D Oops, sorry. Uh, the probability of any word that begins with D is 0 0.95. And by using these algorithms to uh, manipulate the automaton, 
you can say, okay, the probability of generating D at the very beginning is 0 0.95, <laughs> and then I'm going to pay some more probability when we get later on. We decide between dog and door, essentially. So um, I, I've left out most of the details here, but it's kind of a nice uh, way of doing things. And it would also enable you to do more interesting linguistically motivated things, which I'm going to be talking about at the end of the talk. Um, so basically the way we, uh, the way we do this is we have our LSTM probability, our frequency based probability from the automaton. And, um, so we just interpolate them together with a constant, which says, how much am I going to pay attention to the lexicon? How much am I going to pay attention to the LSTM? And we tune this uh, constant. So if we look at uh, self-training, uh, we, uh, have our first pass. We have our supervised model that I described before. And uh, self-training on its own improves performance a bit, uh, about 10%, just without any tricks uh, whatsoever. Oh, and uh, sorry, on I knew where the values were already good, it, it hurt a little bit because you know the model was already uh, doing quite well. And then if we add the lexically aware decoding, uh, this helps. It removed our decrease on I knew, and then it also improved uh, a bit on Yaka and Kwakula. And I think also maybe importantly is like if you wanted to use the output of this in something like a, um, a search engine or a concordance or, or something like this, it's very important to have the words be consistent. So you can look at all instances of the words across a corpus. And by doing the lexically aware uh, stuff to make the words more consistent, I think that might also help in those settings as well. Okay, so that's the summary of the digitization part. Um, so, you know, thousands of languages do not have easily accessible text to build NLP models. Um, text data does exist in many of these languages, but it's locked away in formats that we can't easily use. Um, and OCR post correction improves the text extraction in very low resource settings. Um, so, this is kind of the like straight up uh, research uh, or experimental uh, version of this, but we also um, have had quite a few people use this uh, to digitize their own text. Um, one particular example that we've been involved in um, kind of more directly is a digitization of text in Kwakwala, which is uh, a language from British, uh, British Columbia and Canada, or uh, um, actually uh, Vancouver Island outside of, um, uh, Vancouver Island in particular. And um, we've been collaborating with both documentary linguists and Kwakwala speakers. Um, and we, in doing so, we identified the documents that would be most useful to extract text from. Uh, and specifically, we extracted uh, some from the Boaz texts, which are 10 volumes of Kwakwala language and community documentation produced in 1921, so uh, slightly over 100 years ago. Um, and they have a, a lot of cultural and linguistic value. Um, but they're minimally accessible right now because they're, you know, all in PDF format. So you have to do manual search through the scanned images at the moment. And it's also in a legacy orthography that's very hard for modern speakers of the language to read. So they can't as easily use it uh, to do, uh, to be learning the language if they would like. Um, there's 1,500 uh, pages converted to machine readable format. Um, and uh, or based on our research, we converted 1,500 languages to machine readable format. It's searchable. And also um, we're working on transliteration where we take the legacy orthography and transliterate it into a more modern one that's easier and more accessible. Um, so this is just one example. Um, we've also had uh, a lot of people use this and report uh, using it to us. So the software is open source and has been used on uh, languages such as Bhutia, Sanskrit, Quechua, Igbo, Tibetan, uh, Piaroa, Sekwepem, uh, sorry, that's a new one for me. It wasn't on the slide last time I presented the slides, so I, I apologize. And to be Luricha. Um, and, you know, a variety of different um, styles, uh, anywhere from handwritten notes to typewritten things to uh, dictionaries. Um, so it, we've also used this to extract text to train machine translation systems. Okay. So then the next part of the talk, I want to talk about a different variety of resources that I feel has been maybe a little bit underutilized, mostly in uh, you know, like mainstream NLP uh, research nowadays. And that's namely uh, bilingual lexicons. 
And so if we are thinking about multilingual pre-trained models, as mentioned before, they're often trained on something like Wikipedia or Common Crawl or other things like this. Um, and they're trained on text, usually uh, sentences worth of text. And um, then we pre-train the model, we fine tune it on whatever annotated data we have, maybe in English, and then uh, apply it to uh, a target language a task for inference. And um, so there's a number of ways that people have uh, adapted these models, uh, such as continued mass language modeling using monolingual data in the target language T, um, and also using parallel data to uh, translate English task specific data into the target language and then do supervised training on the, uh, on the translated data there. So um, we also did a kind of a, a survey of the languages where we could get, uh, you know, this sort of textual data that we would need to apply these. And about 1% of the languages in the world uh, are covered by uh, MBERT. About 4% are covered by Wikipedia and common crawl textual data that's easily available. Um, about 23% are covered by some version of the Bible that we were able to download easily. And uh, that still leaves 77% of the languages in the world where none of these textual resources are, uh, were available to us in an easily uh, usable format. So um, there's also a nice paper by Joshi et al. in 2020 where they uh, also point out this problem uh, and talk about how the majority of the world's language cannot benefit due to the lack of labeled or unlabeled data. And um, so no text languages uh, is what we're calling them here. Uh, that's about 80% of languages and few texts are maybe like a few unlabeled uh, texts are available such as the Bible or you know, language document, uh, those from language documentation, uh, but they have very limited resources. Uh, another thing I should point out here is that this doesn't mean that these languages are not, you know, like that NLP is not necessary or useful for these languages, largely because many of the languages are, you know, spoken languages. Um, and so they might not have readily available text or they might have only noisy ASR results, but still you could be, um, uh, building uh, tools for them nonetheless. So as an alternative data source, um, we note that linguists have been documenting languages for years. And one of the most common uh, products of linguistic documentation is uh, lexicons. And um, for example, Panlex is a database that has many of these lexicons um, in a standardized format in uh, what they say is 5,700 languages. Um, a caveat here is that there is 5,700 languages, but uh, these languages have a very various level of coverage. You know, some have lots of data, some have little data, but nonetheless, uh, there are uh, there is a lot here. And so, if you look uh, there, that would bring us much closer to you know covering most of the languages in the world in some way. Um, so. There's a lot of difficulty in using this data. Um, you know, it's small, it's noisy. Um, like uh, there's problems with things like morphology, which are, are hard to handle in arbitrary languages in the world. So I, I want to point out that the methodology we're taking here, I think is more the beginning uh, than the be all and end all. So what we did was we took a very simple uh, method for uh, using these models to try to improve uh, you know, training on uh, languages with very few uh, resources. And uh, so we took two different approaches. The first one is to create pseudo monolingual data um, to replace words in English monolingual data to its corresponding translation in the target language T. And uh, then we, uh, so it looks a little bit like this. And then we continue uh, training the multi um, mass language model on this automatically generated data. And you can see that this doesn't look, you know, this doesn't look like the uh, like actual language. There's a lot of English words mixed in and other things like this, but nonetheless, it might be enough to kind of anchor the embeddings of the words in the same space as the embeddings of English and uh, improve performance somewhat. Um, we also uh, did a 
uh, pseudo fine tuning method. And this is more analogous to the translation based method that I mentioned before. And so we replace words into English uh, task specific data to the corresponding translation in the target language T. And this uh, gives us something that looks a little bit like part of speech annotated data in uh, the target language. And um, so then we can use uh, the uh, pseudo uh, mass, uh, the mass language model on the pseudo monolingual data or uh, fine tuning on the pseudo uh, task specific data or both. And uh, we did this experiments. Um, we used a model of MBERT uh, tasks of named entity recognition, part of speech tagging, dependency parsing. Uh, and we use ling uh, 19 languages not covered by multilingual BERT pre training. And uh, from the results, uh, these are just average results. We have you know, the whole uh, list of all of the results in the papers. Um, but if we look at two settings, one setting where we have no text and one setting uh, where we have only a small amount of monolingual text to be uh, training the uh, model on, um, we can see that even having a small amount of monolingual text is much better than uh, having no text. And um, so these are, oh, sorry, my, my apologies. So these are, um, these are improvements uh, over uh, not having any, uh, not having any uh, synthesized data in the target language. So you can see in the no text setting, the gains are larger. In the few text setting, the gains are smaller, but nonetheless, we get, uh, we get gains uh, kind of across the board for all of these tasks. Um, one issue we encountered when we were doing this is because the method were, uh, um, Applying here is so simple, there's uh, label noise introduced. Uh, so for example, um, here, because we were simply looking up uh, in the dictionary whether the word existed or not, um, it might get the wrong sense of the word. Um, and so in this particular case, it uh, uh, predicted the, the word sense, uh, or it replaced the word uh, will as, uh, as a verb into uh, the noun. Uh, meaning desire or will. And um, so then the original uh, English part of speech tag is still auxiliary verb and it's inconsistent with the replaced words. So um, we also did a simple variety of self-training where we use the fine-tuned model to correct the labels for the pseudo task data. Um, and uh, so we uh, call this label distillation and basically we rerun the fine-tuned model and the fine-tuned model actually predicts that this is a noun um, based on the context, and this um, makes it uh, makes it possible to retrain the model um, and further uh, improve the performance. Especially, uh, this is especially the case in the few text setting. So we also compare to a few shot learning where we have a very small amount of uh, available data in the language. So we have the best adapted model uh, from our uh, our method and 10-shot uh, learning, 100-shot learning, and the best adapted plus 100-shot learning. And so we can see if we only have 10 examples, uh, training on them helps in uh, three out of the four languages that we did the experiments on. 100-shot um, uh, is uh, similar to using our adapted model. So basically, um, our adaptation methods are about as effective as having 100 labeled examples. And uh, then if you combine our uh, adaptation strategies with 100 shot uh, learning, we can see that sometimes the gains stack and it's a little bit better to use both at once. Uh, sometimes they, they don't, uh, but nonetheless, uh, adaptation plus our best adapted model or our best adapted model uh, tends to be the best in uh, almost all of the languages. So uh, this is the overall conclusion to my talk. I presented uh, two different uh, methods to unlock new resources, namely uh, untranscribed text and uh, bilingual lexicons, or, or and uh, le bilingual lexicons for use in uh, NLP systems. Um, so what's next? And there's so many, so many more things to do. Um, unfortunately, Shruti and Cindy are both graduating, so I, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm hoping I can find somebody, uh, somebody else wonderful who can uh, carry the torch. But um, some, uh, basically, some things we would like to do is put more linguistics into these models. So um, 
OCR, uh, we demonstrated the utility of lexically aware decoding, but in the lexically aware decoding, we were just looking up words that appeared in dictionaries or words that appeared in our transcribed data. And this has no morphological generalization whatsoever, right? So if instead we could uh, induce morphological paradigms somehow and modify our weighted finite state automata to reflect how morpho morphological inflection happens in the language, that would allow them to generalize much better and presumably be much more effective. Um, another thing is our data synthesis method uh, using lexicons was extremely simple. Um, we also have some previous work where we did things like syntactic reordering uh, between the languages to, um, to try to make the word order of uh, synthesized data look more like the word order of the actual language. And I think these two things could potentially be combined together. It would be even better if we could also do morphological inflection or other things like this. And I think, you know, one nice thing is um, we have uh, databases like walls that tell us in general, you know, what is the word order? Uh, what does the morphology look like? And other things like this that we could potentially use to inform uh, these data synthesis methods much more. And I, I think it would be amazing if we could get something that looked remotely like the language without any, you know, without any actual text in the language. Um, so that, that's another thing we are thinking about but haven't started working on yet. Um, and also uh, my final goal in my passion is uh, like at the moment, one of the big ones is language uh, education for uh, especially endangered languages. And um, I, I'm very encouraged by, you know, the, um, the starts that uh, various people have made in this direction. Um, and, whoops, I thought I had an extra bullet there. But um, basically, one of, there's a bunch of different directions we could go in this, uh, in this area. Like, for example, once these things are indexed, we can use them as examples for language learners. Um, I will be talking a little bit later today in a different workshop on how we can extract uh, rules that can be used in language education from parsed text. And so if we could extract things like interlinear glosses, or we could uh, somehow run a parser over extract text, maybe we could extract, you know, uh, grammatical descriptions and also like the precision grammars that are done in the uh, aggregation project as well. So um, I, I think, you know, uh, that unlocking the resources so that they can be useful downstream uh, for any application whatsoever, but mostly language education is something that I'm, I'm very passionate about and will love to uh, talk about as well. So um, yeah, that's all I, I have. And uh, thank you for listening. Thank you. I'm going to introduce myself again for the benefit of folks online. I was attending online yesterday. I realized that I didn't recognize people by voice. I'm Emily Bender from the University of Washington, as you know. <laughs> and um, I was glad to see you bring up this point of morphologically aware soft constraints for OCR, because I was wondering along the way if your technique of using lexically aware things worked better for more morphologically simple languages, and if you were able to measure that effect. Yes. Um, and I think the answer is, let me go back to the actual results there. And so the answer is, if you look here, it's not entirely clear because Quaquila is also, you know, very morphologically complex, um, but Quaquila is also the worst uh, overall. So I think there was more headroom there. Um, my intuition is that is totally what is going to happen if you keep all things equal, but we only have four languages that we experimented on. So it's kind of hard to like pick apart that effect. So. Yeah, I guess the other way to look into it would be error analysis. So places where that technique led you down the wrong path. Um, if it had to do with cases where you had a different inflected form of the word, for example. Yeah, that, um, that's a very good point. We have done error analysis on this, but I don't think we did the error analysis specifically of the lexically aware decodings. Uh, 
Um, hi, uh, I'm Michael Ellsworth, um, FrameNet, uh, UC Berkeley, uh, also working at Pinterest. Anyway, um, I'm here as a linguist though. Um, my question is, um, have you done, or are you interested in doing studies on um, what the time reduction, the work reduction is for getting resources to the point where they can really be used for instruction? So you, you'll have an output. It's better than having nothing for a lot of stuff, but to really be able to teach languages, you'll still need to invest some time to make those language resources usable to the speakers. Or yes. Um, so I, I don't know if I have a direct answer to exactly your question, but we have done a user study uh, that we just finished on transcribing Quaquila. And we had uh, two language community members, one linguist, and then four random people that we hired on Upwork um do uh do the transcription and the results are it's basically like first pass ocr from google ocr helps a whole lot um with respect to uh how quickly people can do the job um and uh post correction also helps maybe 20 percent over that so it's like half i don't quote me on exactly the numbers but my impression is that it's a reduction by half by having any OCR than a reduction by about 20% by having the post correction on top of that. Um, and there's also some other interesting points with respect to that, which is um, some of the people who are learning the language um, were like also saying things like it's harder to transcribe from scratch, but I kind of like to do it because it tests my knowledge and other things like this. So I think there's also a, um, you know, very often if you actually put this in the hands of people from a language community or something like that, they'll not only be wanting to do it to create resources, but also for their own personal benefit. And I've also seen this for ASR transcription. I've, I've seen um, people uh, from who came to a workshop there where they weren't doing it for the money so much as they were doing it, you know, for their own personal growth. Um, so I think there's a lot of interesting things to say there, but with respect to getting something where we could use it for language learning, I think you could put this in a searchable database, which that in itself is useful for language learning, but um, to do other things like extracting grammars from it and using those to create more complex, um, you know, language learning materials, I think, you know, it's an interesting question of whether, you know, post-corrected OCR is already good enough to do something like that automatically or not? Like how, how good does your OCR need to be before it stops hurting your like grammar extraction uh, enough that it's not useful? So yeah, these are all like very interesting questions. Thank you. Are there any more questions? And let's thank Graham one more time. Thanks a lot.